Thank you. Well, firstly, thank you for the opportunity to speak on stage and share my experience. I don't do a lot of speaking these days. I've done a, I've done a bit of the sort of pin circuit when we've been raising investor finance, but um, yeah, it's good to be back on stage. So thank you for your time. By a show of hands, can anyone uh, say whether they have either raised private finance in the past or potentially would do in the future? Okay, so let's call it 100%. Let's call it 100%. Yeah. 100% between friends. Why is it important? Well, 100% of the people in the room have said it's something they either have done in the past or want to do in the future. And um, this will also be applicable if you're a lender. So in the room, I won't ask you to, to show your hands or you'll have a flood of people coming over to ask you for business cards in the break. But it will be also be applicable to lenders because it, it will go through the kind of questions you should be asking as well and the things to think about. So it's important for that reason. It's important because cash and investment is the lifeblood of our businesses. One of the forms of leverage uh, that we talk about is actually capital, so actually being able to leverage and use other people's money to do more deals, do bigger deals, stuff like that, uh, is all absolutely key. It can help you through you know, difficult times, recessions, it can help you expand your portfolio, it can help you with cash flow in growing your businesses, so I think we'd all agree it's like super important. Cool. Okay, so strategy, start with the end in mind. So, you know, a typically property entrepreneur thing to do is like, don't start until it's finished. Think about why you actually need the money. So what are you using the money for? How much do you need? How long do you need it for? What's the, you know, what's the risk profile of it? What security can you offer? Those kind of things. Can you service interest monthly or is it something, uh, do you have to roll up, roll up the interest to the end of the project? Maybe there isn't interest involved at all when it's actually a profit share. So really think about why you need the investment. Um, we're going to come on to it later, but we're going to come on to talking about the investor need. So you're the borrower, so you need to match the borrower need with the investor need and bring those things together, get the win-win, and that's how, you, that's how you make the deal work. So always start with why at the beginning, uh, at the beginning of the, pro the process. A really good example of this is if you're raising private investment to buy a single let, house, HMO, flat, whatever, and you're just going to rent it out and you've got a five-year loan and you can afford to pay the money monthly to service the interest monthly. That's a totally different proposition to if you're doing a development, you've got no cash to be able to service the loan for that period of time, and you need to roll it up to the end. So just start with the end in mind um, and understand what the exit is as well. OK, we're going to talk about types of finance. So this is a massive topic, and we could do probably a day just on uh, types of finance. But we're going to talk broadly about um, debt and equity. So both of them get cash in your pocket, which is obviously ideal and is what we want but it's what you're sort of giving in return that's the important thing. So debt is, as, as many of you will know, debt is someone lending you money, you, you agree to pay it back, and usually with an interest rate, okay? When someone lends you money, they're not expecting to ride the wave of what you're investing in, okay? If they lend you money, they're expecting to just get their money monthly, quarterly, annually at the end of the project. They, they shouldn't deserve to be like, oh, I can't afford to pay you this month or whatever. They're not sharing in the upside, and they're not sharing in the downside. Equity is different. With equity, you are selling a part of your business, those investors are going to come on the journey with you. So obviously the risk profiles are completely different, um, and that's why the returns that you would expect to pay or the returns that the investor would expect are totally different for debt versus equity. So we'll talk a little bit about debt. So um, you've got different types of debt. So senior debt, which most people will be uh, familiar with, that's like typically your mortgage. So senior debt usually would come with a first charge. So you'd have your mortgage, or if it was a development loan for a, for a project, uh, you might have a first charge on it. And that would generally be, uh, obviously rates are rocketed at the moment, but for a normal, uh, a normal mortgage, you're like 4 to 6%, maybe a little bit more if it's specialist. If you're getting into development lending, you're looking at like 8, 10, 12, mezzanine finance up to 15%. So that's debt and equity, different types of security. So as I've said, first charge security. So on debt, you might have first charge security. So that would be um, they're, they're the first to get paid back. If they've got a first charge, they can get your house repossessed effectively. So you might have seen the adverts on TV that's like, you know, your home may be at risk if you do not keep up repayments on your mortgage or other loans secured on it, that kind of jazz. So that's first charge. So that's generally quite secure, and that's why the rates on first charge lending are lower, because it's quite a secured investment. You've got the assets sitting behind it. Um, you then move to second charge. So similar to first charge, but the second charge can't get a claim on the money until the first charge has been satisfied. So if you're already at 75% loan to value on your first charge, that's got to be cleared before the second charge can get a look in. So there is some security there, but it's not as good as the, as the first charge. You might have heard the term RX1 as well. So that's a form of security. That's, that's a restriction that can be lodged at land registry. It's something you can offer your investors. 
effectively what a restriction does is it prevents you as the borrower from transacting with that property, so you can't refinance it, you can't sell it. So it gives, us, it gives the lender some security that they know their investment is, the money's tied up, but they can't actually force a repossession on the property. Um, so it's something, it's a tool in your arsenal and it can be used, um, but it's not as good obviously as a second charge and then not as good as a first charge. Um, and then we'll talk about personal guarantees as well. So many of you will, I won't ask you to put your hands up as well, but many of you will have already experienced personal guarantees. Um, the personal guarantee takes the liability from the company and puts it into your personal name. And not only does it do that, generally they are joint and several in, in liability. So if you've got a personal guarantee that's for a million quid and there's four directors that have signed up to it, that's not 250K per director, that's a million quid per director. And they will chase you, they will chase everyone for the whole million and just see who they can get it off. So that's one thing you need to be aware of with, uh, with PGs. Just, brought, just quickly on PGs, I generally look at them as two types in terms of risk. I think of my PGs that are on HMOs, flats and houses, 75% loan to value. It's fairly low risk and it's actually no different to when we used to just buy property in our own name. That's one type of PG, quite happy to sign those all day because they're, they're asset backed. And then the other side is private investor PGs and um, PGs on development finance. Those you've got to be a lot more considered around whether um, you want to sign them or not. You, you usually need independent legal advice to get the PG signed. Um, you go in and the solicitor will say, don't sign this unless you need the money, which obviously you do, so you end up signing it. Okay, so network. This is the network in, the, in real life, so like we're sitting here, pin meetings, all that kind of stuff, and also networking online. So it can be either. And I would go as far to say that all the money you need for your next deal is already in your network. Whether, you've, whether you're posting on social media now, whether you're going to, whether you talk about what you do at family events and social things and with other parents and stuff like that, the people around you will have the money, will have the money you need. So one example of this for me, um, I went to school with a guy, I was a good friend, we didn't talk for 10 years, we went different ways after uni, um, and then 10 years later, I was obviously posting all the time about our property journey, he then sent me this message. That investor has invested million pounds with us as one facility and a further pounds and I didn't do all I did was it was actually about nine months after nine months or so after that that message but up until then all I'd done was just post on social about what I'd, what I'd been up to so like that's the power of what this stuff what this stuff can do so obviously I casually was like yeah sounds great I just sent some stuff over but I was like oh my god this is amazing so back to network um Chris Chris Moss will talk to you about this all day long consistency credibility um, get your content out there, show you're credible, talk about what you're doing. I'm not going to sort of tread on his toes and talk about marketing stuff, but um, follow the content calendar and look at your content calendar versus actual campaigns. You don't want to be asking for money all the time. I'll talk about this a bit later, but you want to have your content calendar set up and then go into campaigns when you're actually asking for, uh, asking for money. Um, and on this as well, just think about the sort of... Uh, who, uh, you might have read the book The Millionaire Next Door, it's the people that you least suspect will have the money, right? It's not the, it's not the flashy cars, it's not the big houses, um, all that kind of stuff. It's the, it's the humble people that have got, in, got inheritance, are good at saving, have sold a business. They're the kind of people that have got um, deep pockets. Okay, that's that one. Jab, 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 right hook. Um, anyone heard of this phrase, jab, 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 right hook before? Yeah, a few people. So this is Gary Vee's phrase. You can think of it as give, 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 ask. So give content, give content, give content give your insight, give your perspective, share your journey, and then at a time you can ask and you can have the investor ask. I would actually say give, 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 ask. Like you probably, that's the sort of ratio of what you want to do. You don't want to be ramming it down people's throats. You want to use the oversubscribe model. You don't want to be like looking so desperate for investment that you're constantly just saying like just, just, just give investment. So um, yeah, and have an interesting story. That's why people are going to be following you and you can ask for the investment at the right time. Um, finally, on this point, always be raising, right? From an investor's, investor point of view, you want to be oversubscribed. Being oversubscribed with investors means you can negotiate rates down, means you've always got cash on hand, um, it means you can do bigger deals, it means you can do more deals, just, just always, always be raising. Okay, sales process. So, so sales process, so we've got, you need to think of this as a, a funnel, right? So you need to take what you're selling is the investment opportunity. It's not a physical product, it's not a service, it's an investment opportunity, and you need to treat it like that. So you start at the top with your prospects, people you've spoken to at networking events, people you spoke to here, online, offline, bring them into the top. 
then you want to start to um, qualify them. Are they, have they got the money? We're going to talk a little bit more about high net worth and sophisticated in a minute. Are they, you know, are they okay from an FCA point of view? Have they got access to funds? Um, do they know, like, trust you, all of that kind of stuff? And just take them through the journey. Um, know, like, trust you, and then you get to the end and you close them. Like, it's a sale. It sounds weird to say, but you actually have to, you know, you have to close a sale. And if you don't close them, it's not a no forever. It's just a no for now. So you need to keep their details. Use a CRM or just use a spreadsheet. We used to use something called Less Annoying CRM, which I think was free or very cheap. Now we just use a spreadsheet. Don't overcomplicate it. Just, just keep their details. Uh, but if it's a no, it's not a no forever. FCA. Okay, so policy statement 13.3 is all about collective investment schemes and basically stopping people losing money on things that they, don't, they didn't understand the investment on. So I think we can all agree that's like a good thing. Um, FCA, so the FCA talk about two uh, types of investment investors that you can talk to, high net worth and sophisticated. High net worth is classed as, they've actually changed the threshold, so high net worth is £300,000 or more of net income a year, or £3 million of uh, net assets. So that's what would be classed as a high net, a high net worth uh, investor. A sophisticated investor, there's four things, and it has to be one of these four. So they're either a member of an angel business networking group, They've made two, or they've made two investments in an unlisted company, and that can, in, that can include uh, like crowd property, uh, you know, crowdfunding, so that's good. So if you're speaking to someone they haven't done that, then that's potentially one of the routes that, that they can go down. Number three is they have to have, or they have to have worked in private equity or in finance for SMEs, so maybe they've got a job doing that, and then they sort of understand the, the complexities there. Or number four, a director of a limited company earning over, uh, turning over more than a million pounds a year. So high net worth or sophisticated. The good news is um, they can self-certify that, a self-certification of like I am high net worth or I am sophisticated, um, and just get that in place. If you speak to different people, they'll say if you do fixed interest rate investments, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't qualify. This is more about JV type deals. You speak to different people, they'll tell you different things. I would just say the investors you're working with, you want to know that they actually understand the risks of what you're doing. Like you don't want to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. There's been plenty of examples of people losing money on investments. So I would just say do it for everyone and make sure they're either high net worth or sophisticated. That's FCA. Investor needs. So we talked earlier about, um, about our needs as a borrower. You need to look at the investor needs. Anyone here heard of Rob Moore? <coughs> yeah, tall guy, rubbish boxer. Um, so... <laughs> When I did the progressive VIP about years ago, one of the things that stuck with me was asking the question, what's most important to you in? And you can do it for a variety of things, motivated sellers, all that kind of stuff. But really, in terms of investors, what's most important to you in, in your investment? That will then give you a real signal about, is it, do they just want as much money as possible? Do they need monthly cash flow? Do they want as much security as possible? If someone just wants security, you telling them that they're going to get 20% a month return on their money... It's not going to give them any comfort. In fact, it's going to scare them off because they're going to be like, well, how the hell can you afford to be you know, paying that much? They'd much rather you say, I can give you 4%, but you're like, absolutely guaranteed to get your money back. So you need to look at it through the lens of what's important to them. Talk about, um, we'll talk about investor meetings in a minute, but talk about security, interest frequency, rate, term. Um, I won't go through it now, but if you Google something called CT61, um, it, you, effectively, if you are borrowing money from a person, a, an individual, into a limited company, you're supposed to deduct income tax at source and pay it to HMRC at 20%, um, and then give them a statement of what's been deducted. There's various ways around it if they can put it into a limited company and stuff like that, but you need to discuss it in the investor meeting because it, it will impact the amount of cash they get if you're paying them monthly, and then suddenly, or at the beginning, they're like getting 20% less. That might not work for what, what their needs are. So... CT, C for Charlie, T for Tango, 61. Okay, so um, investor meetings. I generally don't do investor meetings in person anymore. I'll talk about an exception on one in a minute. But people are generally happy with doing stuff on Zoom. Although I would say if you're starting out, if you're building your credibility, if you're building trust, if you're building rapport, just go out and have teas and coffees with people. Um, I don't need to do it as much anymore because I've got a good database of investors that we work with regularly. But if you need to, just do whatever you need to do. So what I did recently, an investor, I went to Plymouth twice just to meet him, so from London to Plymouth twice, um, the whole day, obviously I could work on the train, um, but I did that because it was a investment, so it was worth my time in doing that, I wouldn't do that for like 10 or 20k, 50k, but if you're starting out, of course, you just, you just do whatever it, whatever it takes. 
Um, build rapport. I generally try and do like, you don't want to force it, but I generally try and do like 45 minutes or an hour of just like, just not talking about the deal. Talk about your family, talk about dogs, talk about, yeah, sausage dogs, whatever, like whatever you want to talk about. Just, um, it, it just builds the trust and the rapport and then you can spend the last um, part of the time talking about the nuts and bolts of the, of the investment. Don't rush, rush the pitch. Think of it like a date. You know, you might go on a few dates and prepare for all questions. You don't want to be sitting there and they say, what are you using the money for? And you're like, oh, oh, oh. or like, what happens if it goes barely up? And you're like, oh, you just want to be prepared for all eventualities. So prepare. Paperwork and systems. Um, so loan agreements, use a loan agreement from a solicitor or use your own. We use a hybrid. Sometimes an investor will want to use their own loan agreements from their solicitor. That's fine. Just do whatever it takes. Try and do ele electronic signing where you can and systemize early warning on investor loan repayment. So six months, nine months, three months before the loan becomes due, make sure you put a reminder in to actually have that conversation around rolling on, yeah, renewing the loan or, or repaying. Okay, last one, repeat. This is my favorite. So repeat investors, I think, where we've done really well over the years and it's really helped us compound what we've been able to do. So with investors, you want three things. You want them to roll on their current investment. So when it comes to the end of the year, the end of the two years, you want them to roll on. You want them to top up, so you want them to add more investment in, and you want them to refer friends and family. And we've benefited from all those, those three things. If you have to, every year, every two years, if you've got money churning in, in and out of projects, if you have to replace the investment every year, every two years, plus get additional investment for new projects you're doing, it's going to be a nightmare. So how do you get investors to stay on, add more in, and refer, the, refer your friends? World-class communication, so make sure you communicate with them, like over-communicate. World-class world paperwork, so just make sure your paperwork's in order. Branded loan agreement documentation, all that kind of stuff. Um, repay and reborrow, so we like to repay investors and then reborrow. So that gives you instant credibility. They get the money back and they're like, oh, it wasn't a scam. So like, then they obviously lend you the money back and then add more in. And the holy grail, which you will get to if you stick at it for long enough, um, is this. So this is one of our investors, and he said, I'm happy to send the money over when it arrives, and we can do the paperwork retrospectively. Like, that's what you want to be getting to. So thank you for your time.